All right. Welcome to our standup for the 19th of December, 2023. What we do is we talk about what we've done over the past week, what we have planned over the next little while. Uh, looking forward to 2024. And if we have any resources that we need, need any resources, and if you have any roadblocks, uh, anything that uh, is preventing you from getting cool things done. So uh, go ahead, Ken, tell us what you've been up to. Uh, most recently, been trying to migrate everything to latest version of Vivado. Looks like there's been some progress there, but uh, had had a few hours of fighting the uh, the tool to get things included. Um, seems like it's working now. And then uh, I'm not sure exactly what updates I gave last week, but I was looking at the code and understand now kind of how you specify channels to the easiest uh, polyphase filter it's with a with the register like there's there's one bit per channel and you pass that in as a parameter on a an axi write um so we won't need to add any extra particular hardware to like subsample the the uh the polyphase filter output it, it should be able to like if we're just working with one channel as we hope to with our software implementation we should be able to configure it correctly and and just have it drive out the uh results we want and that just looking at the at, at the code tracing through um, you know, I, I looked at the the uh, binary input file. Uh, was able to figure that out, but going past the filter stage, it's it's more just looking at looking at things. It looks like things are 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 being crunched reasonably, but yeah, actually knowing what the correct value is versus. Um, yeah, we, the, the the test bench isn't self-checking. So I, I think we'll have to take a leap of faith on this. Uh, at some point, we can try and implement a more self-checking uh, capability, but it's it's going to be an involved effort. So I think I'm I'm happy, you know, just looking at it and seeing things getting crunched. It's uh, lots of lots of data going through various buffers and filters, and it seems like, you know. I'm not seeing any X's or anything like that. So things are, are computing correctly, but we'll have to kind of hold off on the final sign off of it. Maybe we can get some visibility once it's all buttoned up and, and just looking at the contents in the, uh, in the arm. That's it. Well, that's a lot. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Paul, you have the floor. Okay, this week has been an interesting adventure with trying to get the ADRV 9009 to do things for us. Uh, because it's easier, we're concentrating on the transmit side first, just to make sure we know how to make it jump through hoops and, and do things. Um, the thing about the 9009 configuration, from our point of view, is that you don't have a lot of hands-on adjustments to make it instead you have to load uh, something called a profile which has sample rate and lots of other parameters in it um, so you can't fiddle with it really online you have to make a profile and then load that and see what happens and the way you make a profile is with a windows tool provided by manufacturer and uh, it's supposed to know all the tricks uh, that it does that aren't really that well documented or documented at all um, so the only way to, to control the chip, make it do things exactly the way you want is to, is to convince this profile generator tool, which is formerly called filter wizard. and is now called something boring, like configuration tool. I forget exactly the phrase they use. Um, and it, um, imposes all the, the restrictions that it knows about, but doesn't seem to impose all the restrictions that need to be imposed. So sometimes you end up with a profile that doesn't really work. Um, 
and the biggest restriction that we've been fighting with is the profile tool and apparently the hardware design uh, to start with doesn't let you turn the sample rate down very far. Uh, it really is oriented toward wideband operations. And we're trying to operate with software driven uh, samples at the sample level. And when the sample rate, which defaults to 122.88 megahertz, uh, is is so fast, it's almost impossible to keep up in software, even if you're only pretending to, to handle samples. So we've gotten pretty close, actually. Uh, with the profile we've come up with, it's the slowest. We get about half that sample rate, 60-something megahertz, uh, which is still really darn fast for, for software to handle, especially on the... Um, a little arm it's not a high performance processor um, so we carve things away and carve things away and carve things away until all we were doing is pretending uh, loading a, a buffer full of samples which has never been filled with anything meaningful um, and then kicking it off and what we expect to have happen there on the transmit side is that uh, now that you're not doing any work you, you can do it really fast and so you're providing a buffer of samples to the chip uh, very frequently. And pretty soon you're gonna be fast enough that uh, even that really fast chip can't keep up. So what would happen then is that the kernel buffers that are handling these uh, chunks of data will, will all be filled up and it would then have to block. You send it another fake block of samples and it should say, well, I'm, wait a minute, I'm not ready. And in that case, it has two documented behaviors. Uh, one is to block, which means it waits until the buffer is actually available for you to put your samples in and your execution pauses until that happens or not blocking, in which case it's supposed to send back an error code saying, try again later. And as far as we can tell, neither one of those modes actually does that. Uh, so something weird is going on. Uh, we're feeding it a buffer about every two milliseconds, which is the as quick as our loop can go, apparently. And um, it should take 17 milliseconds or 34 milliseconds, depending on which math you believe, to actually process one of those buffers. So in very short order, it should fill up and start blocking. But it doesn't, and we don't know why. Uh, meanwhile, um, when we are able to put in put out buffers that that are full of meaningful data which is not quite as fast but still fast enough to to see something useful in the spectrum analyzer and we don't get clean signals we get broad noisy looking signals which we have can see in the time domain are actually uh, you get two blinks of the of the signal and then some silence uh, so the spectrum looks horrible and it's obviously not acceptable for, for transmit. All this stuff, or at least some snapshots of, of this stuff we've been working on has been posted on Slack. You want to see the pictures. Um, we posted some questions about this, especially about the blocking uh, issue on engineer zone, which is the manufacturer's support site and actually got a prompt response, which we have yet to digest. So maybe there's some clues in there. He did not actually answer my direct question, which was, does blocking work? Uh, he said, and instead came back with some other questions for us to investigate. So that'll be the next thing for us. Um, on the remote lab side, I report we have a new user uh, showing up to work on FPGAs. Tilak, who's worked on other stuff in the past with us, is gonna, gonna have access to the remote lab and now do uh, some FPGA work, hopefully. So if you see some unfamiliar names showing up on on your process list, that's why. Um, can't think of anything else going on in the remote lab. It's, it's super exciting. So that's it. Okay, thank you. Now, I'll, I'll stick up for some of the, uh, the good news out of this report is that we're able to command the new chip. So we transitioned from the ADRV 9371, uh, which was originally selected by, by Wally Ritchie, um, and as we've talked about in the past, that wasn't, that did not get the uptake in the market uh, that we'd like to see for a product. Uh, but the 9000 series uh, in other, uh, in, in another direction, the 9009, 9002, 
which includes 9001, 9008. So this family has gotten um, some traction and we decided to go ahead and shift to that particular chip, which means a different radio card on our FPGA stations. Transitions like this are painful because it requires ripping up all that you've done and redoing it with a little bit of a head start in that it's the same manufacturer and family uh, or a big family. So the good news is that we have fought through and stood up these complicated SOCs and we are transmitting over the air and we're controlling it for the most part. Uh, right now we're doing things like, like, uh, hey, here's a buffer that's a tone and here's another buffer that's a tone. We're going to start manipulating the buffers and send out different tones. And we are seeing this just with some unexpected weirdness. Um, the assumption, I think, uh, that we have is that as much as possible is going to be done in the fabric and the relatively small arm uh, A9 is going to be uh, in charge at the top. With the polyphase filter, we will be able to reduce the sample rate down uh, tremendously and and give the arm a, a real job to do, which is uh, opulent voice, single channel. So that's the that's the goal here, and and everybody's working on that from different perspectives and and having different problems and reporting uh, different challenges and solutions. So that's what this meeting is, is sort of about: is to come together and talk about uh, the the roadblocks and and what resources are needed, the progress that's happened. So on the good side is that we've gotten further with the 9009 than we did with the 9371, and we have a clear plan and a lot more uh, HDL or hardware descriptive language stuff to work with. The polyphase filter bank and uh, multi-rate processing is is really current, modern stuff. This is uh, this is how you do it. Uh, so it's as a uh, cutting edge as you can get. Really, it's the right tool for the job. Um, it also is challenging and and complicated. So on the good side, lots and lots of progress. Uh, I guess on the challenge side is that the, a lot of the things that we're describing here and dealing with are things that are not supposed to happen. Uh, and some of them uh, have been acknowledged and, and, and we've gotten some support. And, and, and some of them, I think we, we could all probably say that we would have liked to have gotten uh, better documentation and better support. Not terribly unusual for complicated systems like this that cut across multiple uh, companies' uh, work. So that's that's my contribution. Um, what I've done technically in the lab, uh, lots. I've been involved uh, with a number of these these issues, uh, trying to get the nine thousand nine to to work right. Um, the big step forward for me was getting seeing a profile from TES or the, the utility from analog devices, seeing a profile that we made actually get taken by the, the machine that it's supposed to uh, order around. So this profile is supposed to configure the this complicated SOC. We have achieved that and that's a, a big deal to me. So even though some of the effects are not what we expected and we're not seeing as clean behavior as we would like, I'm completely thrilled that that we can then check this off and uh, and move forward using this particular utility with this particular version of the uh, of the image, essentially, you know, the Linux image that runs on the SOC seems to be working well with the with the configuration software that we have, and all of this that that we can publish and describe uh, is is of benefit to anybody else that's doing this work. And the feedback that we've gotten is uh, a, a lot of thank yous. So not working yet, uh, but we're coming together and making a lot of progress. The goal is to combine this, uh, you know, this multi-rate sort of filter. So uh, essentially picking out a channel is is going to get us from our current 61.44 megahertz SOC uh, down to around about 150 kilohertz that channel will be delivered to the arm and the arm will be able to do some some pretty complicated stuff it's a it's a really nice um, 
a bit of code, an opulent voice, and an over-the-air demo using that single channel, you know, run by a processor will be good. Moving more and more of those functions to the programmable logic fabric uh, is the goal. That's that's where all of this stuff is assumed to be. So uh, at some level, we're kind of working uh, against the grain a bit. Uh, all of these companies kind of assume that you're going to be doing all this stuff in the programmable logic and that the ARM is not going to be handling sample by sample stuff. It's just that that's where our code base is. That's where development has occurred. Uh, and that's what we are we need to prototype and and to figure out how to use it uh, from the from from that level from the the upper upper levels or upper layers uh, on the processor side. So thank you to everybody. There's a long list of people that have helped us over the past week, especially, um, and ev everybody here and everybody that's listening. Thank you. Uh, this is not easy work, and you know we're what we're doing is trying to figure it out and then write it down and and make sure that it's available and findable to other people that are also doing uh, this sort of stuff and it's uh, it'll pay off we'll we'll get there okay any any other comments or questions or resources needed before we close one other thing about remote lab that I should have mentioned there's a a new document published about terminal access to the uh, to the various remote target systems like the 9009 that we're trying to, to run these tests on. Uh, it's in a pull request waiting for uh, for some review at the moment, but we've been using mostly a serial port, which has some limitations. And this document describes those limitations and reasons why you might still need to use a serial port anyway, but suggests using SSH sessions instead to, uh, or in addition, to get better flexibility. Uh, so anyone who wants to take a look at that uh, pull request and, and review it, that'd be welcome. Uh, document will get published here pretty shortly, regardless of review, I guess. Um, so that's the one last thing on Remote Lab. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we we went all the way back to the HDL uh, and, and rebuilt it uh, for two different reasons. Uh, we were having some, some significant challenges. It's you can see it in Slack and the FPGA challenge uh, or FPGA channel, uh, but but also uh, there'd been a sort of a feature request for a while to to maybe enable SSH access to the target rather than just through the serial port. the The biggest limitation that Paul's talking about is that one person can use it as a time, and it doesn't give you, um, you know, it's it's, it's not an, as nice an experience. So the the way that you get SSH access to the target is a, a configuration in Pata Linux. So when you build the image, um, this is a, a thing that you you have to do. You have to go in and configure it uh, in the in that particular process. And so so that's been uh, not just produced and and tested and used in the lab, um, but there's the document that Paul's talking about will be written in order to describe how to actually use this feature. And then the parts of the uh, working with FPGA's document on how to actually uh, put this into your image um, has has also been edited. So the lots of documentation has happened over the past week and and will continue to, to kind of like uh, show up in uh, uh, GitHub Ops, so our GitHub's operation channel in Slack tracks all of the subscribed channels or all the subscribed repositories. So if you're interested in seeing the actual published changes, the issues and PRs and uh, changes to all of their different repositories, then that particular uh, set of things is is linked and and surfaced, uh, published uh, on a, an, in a Slack channel. So that everybody can see what's what's kind of going on. Um, yeah. So so thanks. That's a that's a good thing to mention. The problem with the serial port is actually even worse than than that. It's not just one person. It's actually only one window, really, in one terminal. So if you're doing something interactive on one terminal and you want to have some other terminal displaying some status, 
you can't. <laughs> so yeah, there's no such limitation with SSH sessions. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a big improvement and, and a good to be folded in. Um, all right. Anything else before we close? Merry Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Merry Christmas and very happy holidays to you and everybody else following our work. We couldn't do it without you. And thank you so much for all of the support and uh, contributions and uh, advice that we've gotten recently. It is deeply appreciated. We, uh, yeah, we couldn't do this sort of stuff without you. And looking forward to uh, continuing uh, good progress uh, around the world with a variety of different organizations that we work with. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you soon.